Hello, I'm the Angry Spork, taking issue with Masters of the Universe, the Shard of Darkness. After his comic relief elf finds a powerful crystal, He-Man is tasked by the Sorceress with finding other fragments like it so they can be banished for the good of the world. However, she left out how the longer he holds onto it, the more he wants its power, and he closes in on his target as he encounters Evil Lynn, who has her own plans for the Shard. The main cover features Evil Lynn wearing the Shard of Darkness around her neck and firing red lightning all over. This ought to get Rhonda to shut up about her 14 carat engagement ring. The alternate wraparound is less exciting, but featuring the more notable evil henchmen while their boss sits in a chair off to the side. It looks like they're all standing around for a group photo at a department store. Picking up where we left off, Evil Lynn assures she's not here to fight, and having been watching him, knows what He-Man is planning. Since some of Skeletor's own minions aren't thrilled with his leadership, she suggests the two of them use the fragments to do away with the Warlord as her eyes begin glowing. Muscles isn't convinced, not believing someone who's only looked out for herself, but she keeps up the act. No woman in her right mind would want to deceive a good-looking man strutting around in little more than a loincloth. Uh, Fan shipping upgraded uh, to level 5! Uh, I repeat... Level 5! Evil Lynn used seductive flirtation. It was ineffective. But she does note that this isn't a plot from Skeletor, otherwise his other goons would be ambushing him right now. Lynn stands to gain the most with her boss taken out, and knows about the crystal He-Man seeks, so he'll need to decide whether or not to accept her aid. Even without a promise, she'll keep her word. She casts a spell that transports them to a holographically hidden secret entrance, leading to one of the several lava tunnels beneath Snake Mountain that Skelly doesn't know about. They're also free of any guardian beasts or traps that the other tunnels might have. Because the skull-faced evil leader doesn't trust anyone, Lin has been able to gain his warrior's loyalty, and once he's gone for good, He-Man can do whatever he likes with the Shikaran fragments. She leads him to the device being worked on by Trapjaw and Triclops, who are naturally surprised to see their enemy walk in as a guest. I haven't vacuumed, I haven't made cookies and lemonade, and that futon I wanted is still on layaway. I might be a psychotic goon, but I still like to be a good host. After a long wait that seems like an eternity, feels kind of appropriate for Eternia, <laughs> she activates the device while expositing that what the hero may know about the crystal is probably total bull. There are only two pieces, the Shard of Darkness Orko found, and the larger portion that Skeletor has been using to boost his own powers, but failing to realize its potential. The central casing of the device begins flowing with energy, until the crystal appears inside, and Lin insists she alone will control the power within once the two pieces are combined. And before she proceeds with any of that, the witch ensnares He-Man with the metal panels of the platform. Ah, curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal! Well, I for one am shocked. Who knew that someone that literally has evil in their name couldn't be trusted? And here, I thought, treachery spoke to what honesty is. In the Royal Palace garage, Man-at-Arms is working on a vehicle while Orko drones on about how awesome he was on Trolla, and having learned nothing from the first issue's flashback, needs to be told not to help with another spell. And given that look on Manny's face, I defy you to convince me he's not thinking of using those cables to throttle the little doofus. He'd rather work the old-fashioned way to get the Bashan Beetle up and running. Toyetic is a word created by marketing people. And avoid any further magical shenanigans. They're both worried about He-Man having been gone for nearly an entire day. Though, considering he had to follow the glowing of a crystal to parts unknown in territory he's not familiar with, Expecting him back within a few weeks sounds implausible. But he's got a tracker on him that they'll notice once he leaves the Dark Hemisphere, and they'll just have to trust that the Sorceress had a reason for sending him on alone. Orko then muses how strange their friend was acting as he left, not unlike the pointy-eared wizard's behavior when he had the power-enhancing shard. He wishes he still had it, however, as it made him even better than on his homeland. 
a statement which gives At Arms an epiphany that sends him running to the King and Queen and gathering the Masters to save He-Man. An epiphany he says he should have realized sooner. Yeah, you uh, really should have. You're supposed to be the smart one. Though, in fairness, given how often Orko's given grief, maybe he took the little guy's sneering remarks as an inevitable breaking of his last nerve. Beneath Snake Mountain, Klops tries taking the innocuous-looking gem from their captive, but that just seems to be the trigger for Muscles to break free of his bonds. He draws his sword, threatening anyone that dares stand between him and the entire Shakaran crystal. Triclops holds his own, if barely, and manages to stab him in the leg, but that only makes He-Man angrier, bringing his blade down on his foe's shoulder. But I guess that's really good armor in his pauldrons because the arm isn't immediately cut off. Maybe it's dislocated or something because Klops just changes sword fighting hands. But it doesn't really help him that much. Given some magical enhancement from Evil Lin, Trapjaw joins the fight and gets one good shove in before he's knocked away. But as the Barbarian approaches the crystal, Trapsy hits his non-stabbed leg with his stun ray, then uses his giant hook hand and throws him against the wall. I've heard of hook shots, but this is ridiculous. Evil Lin force lifts, I mean magic lifts, the shiny keychain from the hero, and it drifts right past her into the clutches of a disappointed Skeletor. You deleted last week's episode of Property Brothers off the DVR before I got a chance to watch it! I will have my revenge! This issue meandered a bit, though mostly because you wouldn't expect He-Man to trust a villainess even when he wasn't affected by a totem, making him more power-hungry. That goes about as well as you could expect, though a couple surprises, like some actual blood and a savage swing that looks like it could have taken Triclops' arm off. Technically weird, because He-Man's supposed to be the most powerful man in the universe, but I understand why we didn't need any dismemberment. Skeletor made for a pretty decent last page surprise, possibly because he hadn't shown up since the first issue, so maybe now he'll get to do something. And look, it only took three issues for Man-at-Arms to realize something that was obvious in issue one! Man-at-Arms? More like Man-at-Vestigial Tail! <laughs> yeah, I don't get that joke either. Tune in next week to see how this story concludes, and if Skeletor finally finishes off his most hated foe, or spends too much time on torture spreadsheets and lets him escape. I'm the Angry Spork, and man have I got issues. Mm -hmm.